Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Sonix today with Drew Wingard, who's going to talk about new ways to save energy in designs. So Drew, one of the new terms that's coming out here is energy processing unit. What is that and how does that apply to current designs? Well, thanks, Ed. Um, an energy processing unit is a, a hardware subsystem that is focused on controlling and managing the power dissipation and energy consumption of all the circuits on an SOC. When we think about APUs, we think about trying to harvest the idle moments that are in the circuits in the chip. And those might be analog circuits or digital circuits, of course. It's a lot easier to talk about the digital ones, but the analog ones are equally important. Specifically in an, in an application area like IoT, where a lot of the uh, energy consumption is dominated by the sensors um, in the real world, of course we have to think a lot about the analog circuits. In an EPU, one of the things we're going to take advantage of is the use of hardware to um, save energy because we can um, use that hardware to make things go faster, more deterministically, and to do it in a distributed fashion that has a set of benefits that I'd like to talk about today. So how much savings are we talking about here? What can you actually eke out of a design? And so you've got an existing design today. You add in some of this energy processing unit type of intelligence into it. What can you save? Well, so Ed, we're early in the um, discovery in this phase, but we've already seen some interesting examples where um, we've seen you know power savings in the 30 to 40 percent for blocks that are running at full rate. And in situations in which we have uh, blocks that are designed for some um, high resolution, but where they spend most of their time running at lower resolutions. We've seen instances where we can save as much as 95% of the energy consumption circuit. People have been doing active power savings for a long time. Why is it important to do in hardware versus software? Okay. Well, so you're right. Um, the people have been employing software controlled power management for a long time. Um, there's some overhead associated with software that's um, meaningful. And I guess I'd like to draw a picture, if it's okay. Um, so if we drew a graph of time versus power dissipation, and we imagine we have a circuit that's going along at some level of power consumption, and then at some moment in time, there's an opportunity to save some power, so we're idle. In power control, one of the big questions is, how much does it cost me in energy and power to try to save this? So in, so in a software-based system, we need to power up or interrupt a processor, which uses a certain amount of power over a certain region of time to actually accomplish the control steps to get to that lower power state. And once we do that, we have some nice green. This is the power that we're saving, right? Now, if you think about what the area of that block is, it's actually energy. It's a certain amount of power spent over a certain amount of time. And power times time is energy. And over here is the amount of energy that we saved by reducing the power for some amount of time. If we're doing it in software, we also have the impact that when we want to turn things back on, we have to wake that processor back up and spend another chunk of roughly the same amount of energy to turn it back on. One of the things we need to be sensitive to is, was the amount of energy we spent larger or smaller than the amount of energy we saved? Of course, if we have spent more than we saved, we've wasted energy. And we would call that power thrashing. Obviously, power thrashing is not something we want to do. How does applying hardware help? Well, by applying hardware, we get two benefits here. One is we're going to do things in state machines instead of a programmable process. And that means the amount of power increase that we go under while we're making the transition is much, much lower. Um, secondly, by doing it in um, hardware, we're going to do it a whole lot faster. And so we can get to that low power state sooner. That means that we save more energy for a longer period of time, 
but we also spent less energy. So that moves us much further away from the risk of power thrashing. And of course, we have that same benefit on the other side. And so as you see, you know, these small uh, blue box represent the amount of energy we might have spent in the EPU. It's much, much smaller than here, and we've saved more energy. Why hasn't this been done in, in hardware in the past? You would think that there's been so much focus on power that people would have taken advantage of this. So I guess I'll say, in, in our experience in talking to the market, we find that there are generally speaking, two kinds of customers in the world. There are the haves and the have-nots. The people who've been building the most aggressively power-managed systems have been doing some of these techniques for some time. People building application processors or baseband processors for smartphones, um, they've been using these techniques. And, and they typically require a relatively large size design team. You know, some of those chips have a thousand designers on it. Maybe there's 20 or 25 that are working on the power system. Um, they tend to be very specialized in what they do. One of the goals with the EPU is to try to take those same ideas and make them available to the rest of the design teams who typically don't have that degree of specialization or uh, such a large design team to be able to go after some of these techniques. It's basically taking the power experts, which used to be a very small subset of the team, and saying everybody can do this now, right? Absolutely, and, and, and part of that is building the right abstractions. But there's also other important aspects to the EPU that make it uh, important, right? One of the things that's, that we didn't talk about as a challenge in doing this in software is, well, this time here is a best case number. That's what it has if the processor is idle, but of course processors are typically not idle. And if you imagine that you might want to be doing this at several points or around several blocks in your chip at the same time, you have to make a decision who's going to get their low power mode changed right now and the other people are going to have to wait. Well, so if you extend this time because you had to wait, well, there's some extra cost to that because I didn't get to save the energy. But if you extend this time on the way back up, then you can generate a real problem because you were waking the circuit back up for some reason. He had some deadline he had to hit. And if you do it in software, the queuing or, or other extra delays that come along from having to contend for the processor resource can cause you to miss a real-time deadline. Well, if there's a risk that you're going to miss a real-time deadline, you can't even do this in the first place. So by doing it in hardware, we can make it more deterministic. We can apply multiple versions of this hardware distributed for each one of the different you know, blocks that we want to power control. In fact, we have coined the term grain, power grain to describe the unit of power control. And to us, a power grain is an umbrella term that covers the ideas of um, individually variable voltage supplies, um, gateable power domains, different variable frequency for clock, you know, clock frequency domains, and then the ability to just shut off clocks or slow down clocks um, to optimize the behavior, so general clocking domains. And so we use power grains as simply a umbrella term that describes a, a structure that, around which we're going to control power. By doing that and building hardware machines that can have as many grain controllers as the user desires, we can guarantee that we're always the fastest and the most deterministic solution. And this plays across a lot of markets too, right? It's, it's everything IoT, everything connected, potentially even cars and data centers. Absolutely. So. Um, Clearly, you know, we, we talk about power and energy. Sometimes they're almost interchangeable, and sometimes they're really not. If you're looking at an IoT application, you're traditionally focused on the battery life. Battery life is an energy dissipation phenomena, and sometimes it's better to, to wake up and do your job as quickly as you can, maybe using a little bit more power over a shorter period of time and then shut down. And other times it's better to to maybe run at a lower voltage and slow things down and run over a longer window. We want to be able to do all of those. And so um, the EPU is not just about managing peak power and not just about managing energy, it's about both. If you're in the data center, it's all about power because it's about cooling, it's about you know, how many um, watt hours, kilowatt hours of energy does it take to run the cooling systems to keep your servers running. And so um, this technology appears to be applicable across that whole ra range of applications, but people will focus in different places depending upon their application. So how much can you actually save in terms of uh, 
existing chips that are out there, existing processes, because each one probably has some inefficiencies in it, even if it's efficient. Yes, so uh, that's a great point. Um, the, the focus that we're trying to bring to this market today is that we should be um, looking much more carefully at um, the times when the circuits aren't doing useful work. To try to harvest the idle moments is the goal of the EPU. And as we peel this onion, we find that there's almost a, a yin-yang relationship between the, uh, the designer's focus today, which is much more on the yin side of the function and trying to get it done at its peak rates and all those things. Um, but when you look carefully at these circuits, you see that the yang side is almost always there, where there are these idle moments, that the circuits are, really, are rarely running in the worst case. You know, typically they, they have some, some peak capacity, some peak throughput they can achieve, and typically they're running far lower than that. Uh, the, the focus of the EPU is to try to help, help harvest, help people harvest those idle moments to greatly reduce the amount of standby power or idle power. Um, in process technologies today, the leakage component is a huge issue, uh, and it's growing. Um, FinFET technology helps us move to a, to a, to a, a lower leakage per transistor, but as we go to deeper generations of FinFET technology, the leakage gets worse again, right? Um, FDSOI helps us control leakage a bit, but as we go to deeper generations of FDSOI, the leakage gets worse again. So um, uh, an important aspect of our view on EPUs is they allow people to apply techniques like power gating in a much more common fashion. Now, to do that, we need there to be a stable implementation platform below us. And we're really glad that the industry's focus and consensus around the UPF standards that have now been part of IEEE 1801 um, has been well disseminated and that the EDA tool vendors and the flow vendors have put together flows that make this kind of aggressive power savings technology practical to use for all design teams. And we rely upon that. So one of the things that's been missing out of, out of uh, really understanding this is performance metrics for power as well as how that interacts with the rest of the system. What are you finding? What, what, what happens here that changes? Right. So one of the challenges that we faced in introducing uh, this product area is it's difficult to predict ahead of time how much power or energy you can save until you actually you know, peel back the onion and work at it. But one thing we can say, you're looking at diagrams like this, is we can talk about the differences between different approaches to power management in terms of how quickly they can react and, and how many and how much power savings they can attempt to deliver. And the metric we've come up with is the idea of millions of power states per second. In other words, how many individual power states can your control system go through in a unit of time? And so a power control system that has a larger MSPS number is clearly going to be able to harvest moments of time that are shorter or more moments over the spread across the surface of the chip in parallel with each other. And so kind of the, the two metrics you can look at is the frequency at which a power controller can switch times the number of power controllers. Now, we're not talking about measuring peak MSPS numbers. We're talking about measuring delivered MSPS numbers. So once you've actually peeled back that onion, looked at the characteristics of the specific circuits you're controlling, identified the idle moments, you want to deploy the EPU that gets you the most power switching for good benefit, right? For, that actually gets you the best power savings. Um, what we've seen in some simple examples that for single blocks in a block diagram, we sometimes find it useful to deploy as many as five million state switches per second in order to be able to harvest the idle moments. Drew Wingard, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.